All right, it's uh, five thirty, so let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. All right, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. It's dark. It's uh, kind of kind of depressing right now, but that's what uh, daylight savings is. So, you know, in exchange for the darkness right now, we got one hour extra sleep yesterday. So, you know, give and take, I guess. Right. Okay. Um, so, first announcement I want to make is I, I finished grading your midterm projects last week. Okay. Um, and so you should be able to see your scores for that on Canvas. And I've also uploaded the, uh, the, the rubric, your rubric as well, okay? And so if you check in the comment section of your, of your submission, you should, you should see that I've uploaded a rubric for everyone, okay? And so on the rubric, you know, I, I tried my best to give as much, um, as much feedback as I can, um, you know, uh, with, with, uh, with which pertains to your specific sections. Um, and so definitely make sure you check out the feedback because the final project is, um, is very, very, uh, similar to that, okay. Um, but just general comments, just overall, I was I was really happy with the with the midterm projects, and so I thought everyone did a really really great job with it. Um, and so you know, all your finite element analysis uh, analyses were really great. Your writing was really top notch too. So you know, I just want to say you know, excellent excellent job on the projects, and um, you know, it makes me look forward to what you guys are gonna do for the final project as well. Okay. All right, and so that's the first thing I wanted to talk about today is I wanted to go over the specifications for the final project. Um, and so I finished writing these up um, literally right before I, I went to my, my four o'clock class today. 
Um, and so, you know, there, there might be a typo or two just because, you know, I wanted to make sure I had it for the lecture today. Um, and so if we see any typos, we can kind of correct them in real time. Okay. Uh, but that's the first thing I wanted to do. And then the other thing I want to do today is finish up our lecture notes on uh, nonlinearity. Um, you know, I think we have about half, half of that left. And so I think that'll be enough content for, for today's lecture. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I think that's all my announcements. Um, we do have one more ANSYS activity before the Thanksgiving break. And so that's going to be next uh, Wednesday. Okay. Um, and that one's going to be modal vibration analysis. So, so I think that'll be a really interesting one as well. Okay. Uh, but, but this week we just have a full lecture week. And so no ANSYS activities, um, just, uh, just lecture stuff. All right. Any questions, uh, any questions I can answer before we, uh, we get started? Okay. All right. So let's talk about the final project. Okay. And so the final project is going to be very, very similar to your midterm project. And so the requirements are, are almost going to be identical. Um, the only, the biggest difference here, um, there, I'd say there's two big differences. And so um, one big difference is that, um, you know, I'm giving you one different geometry, um, but I'm also giving you the option to choose a geometry yourself. Okay. Um, Cause I know a lot of you are coming from industry, um, from industry, um, you know, places, um, and, you know, maybe some of you are also working on research at the same time, too. And so uh, I, I, I always liked it when my class projects allowed me to kind of, you know, double dip a little bit, or I can do an analysis in one class and it, and it kind of complements what I'm doing, maybe in another class or, you know, maybe something else that I'm doing uh, extracurricularly. So, you know, I want, I want to, I think ANSYS is kind of the perfect thing for that. And so I want to make sure I give you that, that option. Um, and then there's, there's also the other big difference is that there, there's going to be some additional requirements based on the things that we've been learning ever since I assigned the first uh, first midterm project, okay? All right, uh, but just like the midterm project, you know, the, the final project is gonna be a full, you know, what I, what I deem to be a full finite element analysis, okay? And so you're gonna perform, you're gonna perform the simulations and you're gonna write the report just similar to the, to the midterm project, okay? There's just some extra components here as well, okay? All right, and so, um, you know, I, I don't think it takes that much uh, introducing just because, you know, you guys just kind of finished doing this, but let's, let's talk about the new geometry, okay? And so the one new geometry that I'm giving you an option to do is this uh, two-story building, okay? And so, you know, it, it's, I think, probably the, the saddest two-story building in existence, but it's, it's a two, it is a two-story building, or at least the shell of one, okay? And so you can perform your final project on this one, okay? Uh, the other option that you have is to do the globe valve or the shaft housing for the midterm project, but you have to pick the one that you didn't do for the midterm project. Okay, um, and so that's another option for you. And so if you if you wanted to do the analysis on the other one, I know I know a couple of you um, you know had a couple, had some hard time deciding. And so if you want to do the other one, you know that option's there for you on the final project. Okay, or the third option you can do for your geometry is to choose something yourself. Okay. Um, but you know, if you if you do choose this option, if you want to choose your own geometry, you know, the only thing I ask is that you you run it by me first, um, you know, just so that we can talk about it and you know, um, and just see if it's feasible for this project. Okay. Right. And so ideally, you know, if you are going to choose your own geometry, you know, ideally the the geometry and the finite element objectives will be, um, um, you know, and, and I and I don't like to use these this word, you know, sufficiently complex. Um, because it's it's not a matter of you know doing a hard analysis and it's, it's not something I want to to to, to, to say. Uh, but what I really wanted to to get at is that you know it, there should be some sufficient um, a sufficient amount of work uh, with regards to the geometry so that you can demonstrate you know that you've mastered the course content. Okay? And so that's that's the part where I I'm, where I'm worried about more. Okay. And so you know don't and so I don't want you to try to find something that's like totally complex just for the sake of being complex. All I really care about is that this project is, or this geometry that you choose, you know, you can you can actually use it to to demonstrate everything that you've learned in the class. Okay, and I think that's 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 the goal of a final project is to show you know that we've taken that you've taken this class for you know 15 weeks, um, and you've learned a ton of stuff, and then this is your chance to kind of show off all of that all that stuff. Okay, um, and so if you are going to choose your own geometry, you know, just just send me an email, just say, hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking of. Um, you know, this maybe it pertains to my research, or maybe this pertains to you know my work, okay? Uh, or maybe this is pertains to an, another project that I'm working on, you know, for for something else. Um, and you know, I think mo most of the time I'll, I'll say yes. Um, you know, this is the first time I'm doing this with grad students, but for my undergraduates, um, I do this I do this project all the time with them, and I I think I've only said no to one person, 
um, you know, for everyone else, you know, I've, I've said yes, or, you know, maybe let's take this, you know, let's, let's work on this, but maybe let's take it in a different direction. Okay. Um, and so most of the things that you come up with, I think will be, will be good. You know, especially at this point of the semester where I think, you know, everyone in the class now has a, has a pretty good understanding of what finite elements is and, and what you can use it for. Um, and so with that in mind, you know, I think, you know, everyone does a pretty good job choosing projects, but, you know, I, I would like you to run it by me first. Okay. Question. I know one of the requirements for the midterm is that you have to change the material. Yeah. But like, so what if we choose the geometry, like a, like a biological system, like a zone or something, or is it just like included in the practice? Yeah. 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 So for those situations where um, you know it's, it's just not feasible to change the material, you can just come up with one more loading um, scenario. Yeah. Um, and I know for the midterm project, I was a little bit picky in that your second loading scenario actually has to have different different loads or different constraints. Um, but if you are in that situation where it only makes sense to use one material, you can take one of your other loading scenarios and just change the magnitude of the load. And so let's say that you know you're applying like a hundred pound load here. You can say, let me push it until breaking, and then that that'll be my third scenario. And so that that's something you can do for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And so um, you know, for this one, you can choose. Let's see, something you're working on for work, or maybe something you're working on for research, um, or just any object or system that's personally interesting to you. Um, and so one and so one thing that you know, not not a lot of students pick this every year, but you know, I always have you know a decent handful. Is that you can pick like a, a, a historical a historical structure, right? Um, and so you can do maybe something like the Arc de Triomphe, uh, or maybe the Eiffel Tower, or maybe not not the Eiffel Tower because that's way too complex, but maybe maybe a portion of the Eiffel Tower, you know, um, you know maybe you want to do a pyramid, right? And so um, from from Egypt, right? And so you know that's that's another option that you can do. And so if you don't have you know if you don't if you're not working on anything on research or you know you can't um, use anything from your work, you know that's another option, right? Um, and so, you know, there's there's a lot of flexibility, right? And so, you know, we've, we've done a lot in this class and, and I wanna make sure that this final project is something that, you know, you work on something that you're you're actually invested in, okay? And so that's that's the whole idea of this, okay? Um, and of course, you know, if you if you do choose this option, um, you are gonna be responsible for supplying the CAD model, okay? Um, so don't come to my office asking for a CAD model of the Eiffel Tower, so I don't have it. And so uh, you have to, you have to, you have to bring that yourself. Um, but if you do have the CAD model, then, um, you know, then I think you know we can make it work for your final project. Okay. Question. So if we do choose to go that route, is half the model the geometry ourselves, or can we get it from an outside resource? Yeah. And so if you do choose this route, you, you can get the geometry from an outside source. Um, the only thing, and, and we'll get to it later, the only place where I think it'll be a little bit it, it'll be really hard to do is if you if you want to do optimization. Um, and so optimization only really works well if you construct the geometry within ANSYS. If you pull in like an outside geometry, it's really hard to do optimization on that. But but it's also but you also don't need to do optimization. It's it's, it's just one of the options for the for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions uh, so far? Okay. All right. So let's talk about the requirements. And so a lot of this hasn't changed from the midterm project. And so you know I'm I'm gonna skip. I'm gonna kind of breeze over a lot of those things. Okay. Uh, and so the first thing you need is an objective. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I think everyone did a really great job with this on their projects and so, you know, on their midterm projects. And so I don't think I need to say too much here, uh, but just to kind of remind you that, you know, whenever you perform a finite element analysis, you know, you're often looking for something, right? And so you're not just performing a finite element, you know, just to produce pretty pictures or make a pretty animation, right? You're interested in solving for, you know, what is the structural stress? What is the total deformation here, right? Um, and so, you know, a lot of that is informed by, you know, what is the physical situation that you're modeling, okay? Um, and so if you choose your own geometry, you know, I think you're, I think the objectives, I think will be really interesting and really varied, okay? Uh, but make sure you have an objective, okay? Um, but again, you know, everyone did a really great job with this, so, you know, I don't think I need to say more, okay? All right, finite element modeling methodology, okay? And so just like the midterm project, you know, you have to choose uh, an appropriate material, you have to justify it, you have to choose, you know, meshing settings, you have to justify it, you have to choose boundary conditions, you have to justify it. So, you know, all of that is, is exactly the same as it was um, before, okay? Um, the only, the only um, um, the, the biggest addition here is that in addition to, you know, um, you know, justifying those things, I want everyone to perform a mesh convergence test for their, for their final project as well, okay? Um, and so I, I know some of you did this already for the midterm project, and, you know, I, I thought that was really great. But for the final project, you know, this is going to be a requirement. And so you have to do a, a mesh convergence test 
um, in order to show that your results are converged. Okay. Um, or I, sh I should rephrase that. And so, you know, I think for, for a lot of you, I think, and, and for those of you who did a mesh conversion test already, you can, you'll probably have, have seen this, that for, for the limitations that you have using the, the student software, the academic software, um, a lot of times it's really hard to get convergence. And so what you'll see is your plot's still going up or it's still going down, um, and that's okay, right? And so I'm not, I'm not asking you to get convergence because a lot of that is a function of you know, how powerful is your software. Uh, but I want you to go through the exercise, okay? And so I want you to you know, run the simulation several times with several different meshes and then show me a plot to see whether your mesh is converged or not, okay? Um, and showing that data and, and you know, believe it or not, you know, showing that data and saying that you know, I need more power to run my simulation because right? I haven't reached convergence, that's fine too. And so that's something that people do in the industry. You know, that's, that's basically how you get your boss, that's how you convince your boss to buy you a nicer version of the software. And so, um, you know, that's, that's something that happens in industry too. So, you know, when, when I ask you to do this mesh convergence test, I'm not asking, I'm not asking you to actually reach convergence, because I think that'll be really hard to do, especially depending on what kind of loading constraints you put on. Um, but, you know, I at least want you to, to, to perform the test and to show the data for it, because I think that's something important you need to take away from this class. Okay. Question. So if we don't reach convergence, should we still not be in the methodology section, methodology section, or should we wait until our discussion and be like, do the permutations and if the student, you know, there may be a plus or minus percent yeah. on this total? I think you can mention them both. And so in the methodology section, you can mention it from the perspective of, you know, I use the finest mesh I could um, because, you know, I'm still trying to reach convergence. But then, but then in the discussion section, you can say that, you know, if that's where you're talking about your results. You can say that, you know, my results are, you know, these are the results I got, but, you know, maybe they're not the most accurate because I didn't reach convergence yet. Yeah, that's, that's how I would approach it. Yeah. Is there another question? Okay, and so just like the midterm project, you're going to be required to form three um, different static uh, scenarios. Okay, and so at least two of these static scenarios have to be different boundary con um, boundary condition configurations. Okay, and so you know two different loadings, um, just like the midterm project. Okay, and your third configuration can either be a change in material properties uh, or a change in the magnitude of the loading if, if a change in material is not um, is is not appropriate for your for your project. Okay. Um, but I want, but I, I do want at least two um, two boundary condition changes. Okay. All right. And so, in addition to that, you know, I want you to incorporate at least two uh, ANSYS features um, that we've learned in the second half of, of the class. Okay. And so, just to summarize, you know, here's a list of the features that you can uh, that you can incorporate into your final project. Um, and so, this is starting with activity five. And so, activity five was uh, member dynamic simulations. Okay. Um, so you can either do explicit dynamics or you can do transient structural. And so that's an option. Okay. Uh, number two is design optimization. Okay. So that was activity six, which is, you know, what you guys have um, working on right now. Okay. Um, but I will say that, you know, optimization is going to be really hard to do for these, uh, for these projects. Um, you know, most, mostly just because of the cost. Um, but also, you know, if you bring, if you bring in a, a part or a CAD model that's, that was developed outside of ANSYS, um, it's actually really hard to get this to parameterize and and run a proper optimization. And so, um, and so I, I was I was almost debating taking this off, but I but I know that there's some of you that are really interested in optimization too. And so I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to work on it. Um, but just just but just know that it's going to be difficult. Um, it's also probably going to be the most time consuming out of all of these two. And so you know just kind of take that take that into account. Okay. All right, so number three on this list is going to be the subject of activity seven, which is what we're going to do next week. And so that's modal one vibration analysis. And then when we come back from Thanksgiving, um, the first activity and the last one we're going to do is about buckling. Okay. And so that's going to be, um, you know, those are your, those are the, those are the um, last four activities that we're going to do in this class. Okay? Uh, I'm giving you one more option here. And so we don't, I don't have an activity plan for this. Uh, but I have gotten quite a few people asking me to show how to do thermal and fluid simulations. And so I think I'll spend the last week of class just doing a quick, um, just quick workshops on how to do these things. Um, and you don't have to turn anything in for that. But if you want to do a thermal or a fluid simulation on your geometry, um, that's going to be available for you as well. Okay. Um, I will say that, you know, fluids, fluids is going to be really hard to set up. Um, and because I think, you know, what probably most people are thinking of right now is, you know, you're going to do the global valve. And you're going to do a fluid simulation on it, um, but it's 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 going to be hard to set up. And so I'm I'm willing to work with you guys to work to set it up, 
Um, but it, it is going to be hard, and I, and I haven't had a chance to try it yet, too. Because the primary difficulty when you're running a fluid simulation is that when you create your mesh, you have to actually create a mesh of where the fluid is going to be. Okay. Um, and so you can't actually just create a mesh of the pipe itself and then expect fluid to flow through. And so you kind of need to make a mesh of the empty space within the pipe, um, which you can do. It's just, it's just you, you kind of have to work on the cat a little bit to kind of, you know, get a, get a solid model of that empty space. Okay? Um, especially if you want to do, you know, configurations where, you know, you want to do a configuration where the, where the valve is closed, in other words, the valve is open. Um, and so that's, that's going to be, um, that's going to be a little bit difficult. Okay? So I, I, haven't, I haven't quite, you know, sat down and done it yet. I know it's possible, but you know it, it is going to be a bit of work. But uh, but thermal, I, thermal, I think it will be fine to set up. And so thermal is usually not that difficult. And so you know if you want to do thermal, then you know, by all means go ahead and do that. Okay. All right. And so I, I want you to choose at least two of these. Okay, um, you're welcome to do more, of course. Um, but um, you know I'm only going to give you credit for two. Okay, but I want you to be I want you to be thoughtful for these. Okay, and so I don't, I don't want you to just pick the two that's kind of the easiest to do. You know I want you to pick the two that you know, aligns the most with your objectives, okay? And so if you look back at your finite element objectives, right? And so there's there's usually some kind of information, um, some kind of test that you wanna perform with this finite elements, okay? And so the two extra features that you choose should be relatively consistent with your objective, okay? And should, so it shouldn't just be a random thing, okay? Um, and so, you know, I, I don't want you to do, you know, let's say, um, you know, um, let's say that you, you, you run a design optimization on the globe valve, but, you know, changing the, but changing the design was not part of your object objectives, okay? And so that's kind of one example of, you know, doing something just for the heck of it instead of, you know, doing something with, with purpose, okay? Um, and so, you know, make sure you, make sure you choose a feature that's actually relevant for your, for your objective and relevant for your geometry, okay? All right, um, any questions on, on this so far? <clears throat> okay, so that's, so that's most of the new stuff. All right. And so everything else is going to be um, pretty much the same. Okay. So the ANSYS results, um, you know, everyone did a great job with this. And so you just have to show me, you know, total information equivalent stress. Okay. Uh, and so for the additional features, you know, just uh, make sure you show me run one relevant screenshot and some explanation in the text. Okay. Uh, for the discussion, you know, this is the same discussion questions before. Um, I have one uh, additional question here asking you about uh, verification and validation. Uh, which is what we're going to go over probably on Wednesday, okay? Um, and then you have a conclusion um, as well, okay? All right. So I, I don't have the I, so I don't have the template ready yet, um, but you know I will I will get that to you as, as soon as as soon as I could. But you know I did want to get the specifications out to you as, as soon as possible, okay? Um, and since there since there is some additional um, requirements for this one, um, you know I expect. The, the final report to be around the ballpark of 16 to 20 pages okay um, but this is not but this is not a requirement and so you know don't don't just type stuff or don't do like quadruple spacing just to reach this uh, just to reach this mark okay um, and so if your report ends up being 12 pages you know I'm not going to mark you down on it you know as long as all the content is there then that's that's what I'm looking for but if you want an estimate for what I what I kind of think around where the most of the reports going to fall I think it's going to fall in that 16 to 20 range but but again, you know, focus on the content, you know, don't focus on, on the length of the report. Okay. All right. Uh, the rubric has been posted, and so you can check out the rubric as well. Okay, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, teams, um, you know, just like the midterm project, this is going to be an individual project. And so, you know, I don't want anyone working in teams. Okay. Um, and that's it, right? Okay. Uh, any questions before we, uh, we take a look at the, at the rubric? Okay, all right. So let's take a quick look, look at the rubric before we uh, we get into the lecture today. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So here's the rubric. Okay. And so I, I did I did move some points around a little bit just to accommodate for some of the new stuff. Right. Um, but a lot of it, you know, is is kind of the same as as before. Okay. Right. And so you can see here that we have a, I have a section for um, material properties. I have a section for meshing. Okay. I've, in, I've increased the point total for the meshing because you have to do a mesh convergence test now. Okay. We have a boundary condition section. Okay. Um, we have an uh, we have an added section here for the additional ANSYS features that you're going to be using in your project. Okay. And I'm going to be grading you on how well you justify its use. Okay. Um, and how and how consistent that is with the objectives of your project. Okay. Uh, I've lumped together all of the results from your static analysis into one. Okay, so there's going to be a big chunk of the points right there. Okay. 
Uh, and I also have a results section for your additional features. And so that's going to be about half the points of the, uh, of the static ones. Okay. And then we have the discussion. I've, I've beefed up the discussion a little bit because because um, a lot of you, you know, did wrote really thoughtful discussions and I, and I kind of felt bad that it was kind of worth so little on the midterm project. And so I, I've, I've doubled this amount. Okay. And then we have conclusions and then we have um, report aesthetics, you know, just to make sure the report is clean and organized and the language is good and then all that stuff. Um, all right, and so that's the that's the rubric. Okay, and so the only thing, uh, and so the only thing I, I still have to get to you guys is the template uh, for the final report. But I but I figure you know um, probably at first you know everyone's going to be exploring their geometries and running the simulation. So you know I thought I'd get these these out to you first, and then you know I'll get the template to you guys probably next week. Okay. All right. Any final questions on uh, any final questions on this? Oh, due date. We didn't talk about the due date. All right, so the due date is um, Monday, December twentieth. Okay, and so that's going to be that's going to be the that's going to be the Monday after finals week. Okay? Um, and so finals week takes place between what is that? I think the thirteenth and the seventeenth. Yeah, and so finals week is December thirteenth through the seventeenth. Um, and so, you know, I know, you know, a lot of you are taking other classes. And so, you know, I want to make sure I free that week up for you guys so that you can focus on that. Okay. And then just to give you some flexibility, I'm giving you the weekend and that Monday to, to, to finish it. Okay. Uh, but this due date is, is, is rigid. And so I, I can't push this back anymore because if I push this back anymore, um, then I don't get my grading done in time and I miss Christmas with my family and my, and my, you know, my in-laws hate me, my parents hate me and all that stuff. And I don't want to do it. Okay. So this is the, the, so this, this, and so this due date right here is, 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 you know, on non-negotiable. Okay. So this is, this is as far back as I can push it, you know, just so that I have enough time because, because uh, I have the projects from this class and I have projects from three other classes that I have to grade as well. Okay. And so, you know, don't ask me for an extension because this is, this is already as far back as I can push it. All right. Okay. And so that's the final project. And so, you know, definitely, you know, start thinking about that. So you have, um, you know, maybe about, uh, maybe about six weeks to work on it. And so, you know, fair bit of time, but also there's a fair bit of work too. So, um, you know, start early and, and, you know, ask questions when you can. Okay. All right. So let's uh, jump back into the, into the lecture. All right, and so um, you know, before we left off on um, it wasn't last week; it was the week before that. Um, we were talking about nonlinearities in FEA, okay? um, and so you know, I, I apologize for the for the structure of that. I know it's kind of weird to kind of you know have lectures and then take a break for an assignment and then try to pick up where we left off, you know, two weeks ago. Um, and so you know, to, to to kind of put it bluntly, you know, I, I am running a little bit behind on my lectures, and then. You know, that's not on you, that's that's on me. And so, you know, it's you know, I just want to say that I'm sorry for that it's kind of seems disjointed. Like, you know, but I did want to finish talking about it because nonlinearities is is an important um is an important topic for FE. Okay. Um and something that you can incorporate into your final project as well. And so if you want to turn on large deformations and, and nonlinear stuff, you know, you're free to do that um, as well. Okay. All right. <coughs> Uh, but in particular, you know, where we left off is we were talking about um, contact nonlinearity in FEA. Okay. All right. Okay, and so um, you know we we know that whenever we have an assembly of parts, um, you know we have to define the contacts uh, between the different parts. Okay,
And so the way that we do this is we, we, def we, um, we define the context. Um, and so last time, the, the last thing that we covered was the five different types of contacts you can have um, within, uh, within ANSYS, okay? okay. And so the first one is the, is the one that we've been using for everything so far. Uh, which is the bonded uh, bonded contact? Okay. Okay. Which basically means the two parts are welded together. They're super glued together, and so they're um, you know they're they're bonded for life, and so there's a you know, they're both um, together forever. Okay. Okay. All right. The second one that we went over was uh, no separation. And so, with no separation, the um, the two surfaces, or you know, whatever um, whatever uh, whatever things you're making contacts with, um, you know, they have to be um, they always have to be in contact. Okay, so they can't separate, um, but they can slip by each other. You know, by a little bit amount. And so this allows a, a, a very minor amount of, slip, of slippage. Okay. And number three, we had a rough contact. Okay. And so a rough contact um, allows for separation. And so two rough surfaces can separate from each other throughout the course of a finite element simulation. Um, but what we assume with the rough contact is that the, the coefficient of friction is so high that they can't slide past each other at all, okay? Uh, but they can't separate. And so rough is kind of like the opposite of no separation, okay? Uh, next, we had frictionless, uh, frictionless contacts. Okay, and so frictionless, uh, frictionless contact means we have two surfaces in contact with each other, and they can separate and they can slide with no resistance. Okay, and so this is a, you know, um, exactly as it's described, like two two surfaces contacting each other with no friction. And the fifth type of contact that you can have in ANSYS is called frictional, okay? And so frictional contact means that, you know, we have two, um, two um, surfaces in contact. They can separate from each other. They're free to separate. Um, and they can slide past each other, but the sliding past each other is impeded um, by a normal frictional force, right? And so if you're gonna use a frictional contact, you have to define the coefficient of friction, okay? And then the uh, ANSYS uses that coefficient of friction to compute you know, what are the shear stressors or what are the frictional uh, forces between the, uh, between, the, between the two, between the two contexts. Okay? And so out of these, um, out of these contact types, we said that these three right here, these three are the nonlinear contact types. Okay. Right. And the reason these three are considered the nonlinear contact types is because they allow for separation. Okay. And so separation is, is kind of the key point when you know nonlinear behavior occurs, right? Because if you have two points, if you have two surfaces that separate from each other, then that changes the total topology of your um, of your simulation, right? And so two parts which you know normally could support each other is not there anymore. And you might have just kind of large motions that result from that, okay? And so whenever you define a contact that can allow for this separation, then you're, you know, then what you're saying is that, you know, um, then you're kind of opening the door for nonlinear behavior to occur, okay? Um, you know, which is, which is not a bad thing, right? And so a lot of times, you know, you, you want, um, you kind of need to simulate that, that kind of behavior. You know, just kind of be aware that it's going to increase your cost, and it's 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 going to be a little bit more expensive than before. All right. So this is this is kind of just a recap because because I, I know it's been you know a couple of weeks since we since we covered this, and so you know I want to make sure that we kind of recap from where we were. Um, and so, are there any questions on uh, on this so far? Okay. 
All right. And so those are the types of contacts, okay? <clears throat> um, but uh, one thing I, I wanna talk about um, now is that no matter what contact that you choose an ANSYS, you know, all the contacts uh, enforce a no penetration um, type of, of the constraint. Okay. And so what that means is that, you know, one, one surface just can't contact, just can't penetrate into the other one, okay? Uh, and so intuitively, you know, this makes sense, right? If you have two different objects, you know, you can't penetrate one into the other one, right? And so, you know, no, no ghosty, spooky stuff going on, okay? And so to kind of visualize this, you know, let's say that we have, you know, one surface right here, okay? and it's in contact with another one right here, okay? Right? And so what can't happen is that you know we have something where you know the triangle will penetrate into that one there, okay? And so this can't happen. Right. You know, and, and this may seem obvious, right? And so you know, two solid objects, you know, of course they can't penetrate to each other. So what are you know what are you talking about? But you know, numerically, you know, it's 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 kind of a, a big it's kind of a big deal, and, and it's um, it's one of the things that's that's a little bit hard to accomplish numerically um, in practice. Okay? Right, and so um, you know, one one thing that you do have to say. So, so no, so, so the good thing is that you know, even though you know, this, I said that this is hard to do numerically, as a user, you know, this is something you never have to worry about because Ansys kind of handles it for you. Okay, one thing you do have to worry about though is is what you set as the contact and what you set as the target surface. Okay. And so you know you've all you've all experienced this in the class. Um, I think most notably in the bridge project. Okay. Um, and so you know whenever you define a contact between two surfaces, you have to define you know one of them to be what's called the contact, and the other one to be called the target. Okay. Uh, and many of you have asked me what you know what this means, um, and it, and if it matters you know which one you choose as the contact and which one you choose as the target. Okay. Okay. Um, and, it, and it actually does matter. And, and, and the reason it matters is, is because of how ANSYS is checking this no penetration. Okay. And so, uh, and so, you know, in order to properly choose, you know, which which makes a good contact and which makes a good target, you have to understand a little bit of how Ansys is actually doing this. Okay, and so what Ansys actually does is that it it, it performs a check. Okay. Okay. And so as you're running your simulation, right, and so as it's trying to solve for the deformations, what Ansys checks is that it checks to see if the contact surface has penetrated into the target surface.
Okay. Right. And so if if it does check, if it if it if the check succeeds, and so it's, it finds some part of the contact surface inside the target, then Antis will go and correct it. Okay. Okay. Right. And so it corrects it and then it enforces the no penetration. Okay. The important the important thing to see here is that you know it checks one way, right? And so it checks to see if the contacts have penetrated the targets, but it doesn't check the other way, right? And so it doesn't check if the targets are inside the, the contacts. Okay. Um, and so because it only does this one way checking. Then it kind of informs you of what types of, of what types of surfaces you should choose for the targets and what types of surfaces you should choose for the contents. Okay. And so we'll we'll go over that on the on the next page. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. And so since And so since ANSYS only performs this check in one direction, what this tells you is that the, um, the target, the target surface, okay, the target surface is, should be the object or should be the body that's less likely to deform or less likely to move. Okay. And so what does that mean? And so what, what are some things that you should look out for, you know, in order to assess, you know, one, one object being less likely to move than the other. Okay. And so usually these are the parts where your fixed constraints are applied. Okay. And so if your if your particular object has a fixed support um, assigned to it. Then that's usually a good candidate because those are those objects tend to deform less than the other ones. Okay, uh, if both of your objects have fixed supports, then choose the one with more fixed supports. Okay, okay. Um, usually you want to pick this one to be the one that has a higher Young's modulus. And, and um, you know, because if it has a higher Young's modulus, then it's going to be a lot more stiff. It's going to be a lot more rigid. And so because of that, it's going to be a lot less likely to deform. Okay. Okay. Um, and, so the and so the third metric that you can look for is just one that's just bigger than the other one. Okay. Because uh, likely, because if, if, you know, if so, if both of your, if both of your objects are about equal, in terms of their Young's modulus, they're equal in terms of the amount of fixed supports. You know, usually the best thing is to choose the bigger one to be the target. Okay. Um, and so, you know, this, this, and so this is the metric that we use for activity four, right? Um, and so a lot of the contacts that we were choosing were between the beams um, or the ends of the beams and the size of the bridge, right? And so what I told, uh, what I told you all back then was to choose the side of the bridge to be your target surface, just because it was just a lot bigger. Than the uh, um, than the beams, okay. And so because of that, it's less likely to deform, and thus makes a better target surface, okay. Okay. 
And then by that token, you know, the contact surface that you choose, you know, this is going to be the one that's more likely to deform or more likely to, to change its position. And so you would choose the one with less fixed supports. You choose the one with a, a lower Young's modulus. You pick the smaller one, okay? Um, and so, you know, these are the criteria you can use to choose between the target surface and the contact mode, okay? Um, and if, you know, and if both of your surfaces are, are basically equal in all of these, then, you know, probably doesn't matter. And you can choose either one and, you know, you'll still be okay, okay? Um, but this is kind of, the, uh, this is kind of the, the thought process behind how you choose one um, over the other one. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. So that's uh, so that's target versus contact. And so now let's now let's talk a bit about the algorithm that Ansys uses to actually enforce um, no penetration. Okay. And so Ansys has a lot, and I and I actually have all of them written down on on the notes. Uh, but just in the interest of time, you know, I'm just going to talk about the couple, the few major ones that I want you to to know. Okay. All right, so the first one is called MPC. Okay. And so this stands for multi point constraint. Um, and so um, what this does is that this. Uh, this will add some additional constraint equations into your into your global linear system. Okay. Uh, and so what these constraint equations do is that they, they ensure without a shadow of a doubt that the two surface motions are gonna be coupled. And so this basically this basically adds some additional linear equations that said that you know these two surfaces are joined together and their motions are going to be completely coupled and so there's basically no no way that penetration can happen okay and so this is this is the best one that you can do right and so this is the this is the best way to enforce no uh, penetration okay but unfortunately you know this is only available for the linear constraint and so it's only available for a bonded and no separation type of context okay. Okay. Because remember, the, the, the thing that those two contacts have in common is that, you know, there's uh, under those types of constraints or under those types of contacts, you know, the two surfaces, they, you know, they obviously can't penetrate to each other, but they also can't separate from each other either. Okay. Um, and so, and so we can basically make a hard, hard, this is basically a hard constraint to say that, you know, those two surfaces are, you know, they can't penetrate, but they also can't separate. Okay? And so we can we can basically use an additional constraint equation to enforce this. Okay. And so if you're using a bonded or a no separation type of contact, you know there's 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 basically no reason why you use you wouldn't use MPC. Okay. And so it's the default. And so you know just go with that. Okay? Um, but if you're using another type of contact which can allow for separation, 
um, then you then we have to use a different method to enforce this no penetration. Okay. Uh, all right. So any questions on uh, on this so far? Okay. And so if we are using a contact that can allow for separation, we have to use a different, uh, a different algorithm. Okay. And so there's, and so there's a lot, there's a lot of different options within ANSYS. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, we don't, uh, we don't have the time to cover all of them. Um, but I do want to cover uh, what I think is the most interesting one and the, um, you know, and the, I, I think, you know, the one that's most often used in practice. Okay. Uh, and so this, and this includes a lot of the, the research methods that I've seen before too. And so, you know, when I, when I go to, you know, research conferences and I see people, you know, deal with this problem with contact, um, this is, this is a method that's used, you know, uh, quite a bit. Okay. And the method that's, uh, that's, that's, um, you know, that's called, is called, um, or ANSYS calls it pure penalty. Um, but generally speaking, they, they just, people just call it the penalty method, okay? All right. And so the way, and so the way this works, um, and so because, um, because, you know, we're in this kind of weird space where we have to allow for separation, okay? And so we can, we can have, we can have um, deformation in one direction, but we have to prevent it in the other one. That means we have to kind of be a little more creative than how we can do this. Okay? And so the way that the peer penalty works is that it, it doesn't directly enforce no penetration. So it kind of takes an indirect approach. Okay? And so we say that this indirectly, this indirectly enforces no penetration. Uh, and the way it does this is that it applies a bit, what's basically a spring force to kind of eject, eject any penetration from happening. Okay. Okay. Right. And so you'll, you'll see why I, I call it a spring force, right? And so the, the reason it's, it's called a spring force is that the magnitude of the force is proportional to how far the penetration um, um, has occurred. Okay. Um, and so that's the magnitude of the force. And of course, the direction of the force is going to be um, perpendicular to the target surface. And so, you know, this force is always going to be an ejecting force. Okay. Okay. And so the way it works is like this. And so, you know, if I use the same example that I did on the previous page, okay. And so let's say that we have a, um, a square surface here. And so let's say this is our target. Okay. And this triangle that I'm going to draw, you know, this is going to be our contact surface. Okay. Okay. 
And so you can see by the way I, I've drawn this, you know, this contact is obviously penetrating inside the, the chart, okay? And so we need to kick it out. And so, you know, we need to enforce no penetration here, okay? And so the way the, the, the penalty method works is that it measures this distance, okay? And so let's call that Xn, X sub n, okay? Then what ANSYS is gonna do is that it's gonna apply a force in this direction, And so you can consider this basically an additional load. Okay, so ANSYS is, is applying a load kind of automatically. Okay, and so the magnitude of this load is going to be um, the amount of distance that's penetrated. Okay, and so the deeper that we penetrate, you know, the, the larger this load is going to be. Okay, and then we're going to multiply that by a spring constant. Okay. And so this Kn is a, what's called a normal stiffness. Okay. okay. And this Fn right here, this is um, basically our penalty force. Okay. Right, and so the and so the idea is that you know you would you would choose a normal stiffness that's high enough so that whenever you do get penetration occurring, then you have this kind of ejection force that kind of forces it out. Okay, um, and so you know most of the reasons why you would have some kind of penetrating um, penetration to begin with is that you might have an external load that's being applied, you know, on this contact surface. And so you know, let's say that we have some external load being applied this way. Okay. And so normally what you want is you, you would want this triangle to basically squish, right? And so you want it to basically come like this, right? And that's kind of bad, right? right? And so you want the triangle to, you know, of course compress because it's being externally loaded, but you don't want it to penetrate into the target, okay? And so the way that ANSYS enforces this when, when you don't, when you can't do the MPC is that it applies this force, okay? And so on this kind of purple triangle, we have kind of two forces acting. And so we have the external force here on the left, and then we have the penalty force applying on the right. Okay? And so the combination of these two forces basically make it so that the triangle stays outside of the target surface and then does the appropriate amount of deformation that's needed um, in order to, um, you know, in order to um, solve the simulation, okay? All right. And so this normal stiffness right here you know, this, this doesn't have to have any kind of physical significance. And so there's, there's no material property for this. This is purely just a, a numeric, basically a numerical trick in order to enforce no separation. And so, you know, you can, you can basically choose this how you want, okay? okay. And so, you know, um, if you're having if you're having penetration issues, and so if you run kind of a, a simulation with a uh, with a nonlinear contact, and you're seeing that you know you're getting penetration into your model, you can just you know up this up the normal stiffness until you don't get that anymore. Okay, um, but you have to be careful here because I, I think I think the question that everyone asks is that you know why don't we just choose like one bajillion for this normal stiffness? Right? Um, because you know we we want to prevent normal we want to prevent penetration anyway. And we want this normal ejecting force to be as high as possible. And so, you know, why don't we just set this to be, you know, really, really high. And so that whenever we get penetration, we just kick it out automatically. Um, and so you, and so a lot of times you don't want to do that um, because you, you don't want to have too much rubber banding. And so if you, if you imagine that you set this normal stiffness to be, um, I don't even know, you know, like let's, let's say 999 trillion, okay? And so what can happen sometimes that, you know, maybe you're applying an external force of, you know, let's say something modest, like let's say that you're applying a normal, an external force of let's say 100 pounds, okay? And so from that, um, from that um, normal force here, okay? And then from that modest 100 pounds, let's say that you just peek in a little bit, right? you have just a little bit of penetration. If you have this um, normal stiff to speed 999 trillion, then you're, you're just gonna get a massive force that kicks it out from the outside. And then this whole thing is just, is just going to fall fall off the surface, right? 
Um, and so obviously that's not what you want. And so um, obviously you want something that's, you know, going to be high enough to prevent the normal penetration, but you don't want it to be so high that you get this kind of rubber banding, rubber banding effect. Okay. Um, and so, you know, Antis will give you, Antis will give you a default value for this. And so, you know, I would say that, you know, stick, stick around that, stick around that default value. Don't, don't go straight too far. Um, but you can modify this if you want to, you know, enforce um, more no penetration than than before. Okay, um, and so it, it's free for you to to modify, but but don't go but don't go too crazy with it. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on pure penalty? Okay. All right. And so you know, like I said, you know, there there's other methods within ANSYS that you can use to enforce no penetration. Um, but I'd say this is probably the most common one, and, and it's I think the most intuitive as well. And so, you know, I would say stick to this, uh, but you can, but you are of course free to explore the other options as well. Okay. All right. Um, but before before we kind of end for today, we, we have about 15, 20 minutes left. And so I did want to talk about nonlinear materials, which is the third source of um, third source of nonlinearity. Okay. All right. And so, you know, we, we touched on this a, a little bit at, at the very beginning of the semester, right? And so when we, when we had our kind of one lecture on material properties, we talked about how you can have, you know, plastic behavior. We talked about happy elasticity, okay? And so a lot of what, we'll, what we're gonna cover, what I'm gonna cover today is gonna be a little bit of a rehash of that. Um, and so I'm gonna go a little bit quickly. Uh, but I did want to expand a little bit about, you know, what are some situations when you would use plasticity versus what are some situations when you would use hyperelasticity. Okay. All right. And so, um, you know, just to kind of, just to kind of, you know, recap. And so when I say that we have a nonlinear material, uh, what that essentially means is that the stress strain relationship within that material is nonlinear. Okay. Because um, normally for, for a linear material, you know, we have this linear relationship between the, um, uh, between the, um, the stress of the material and the amount of strain, okay? But for nonlinear ones, that linear relationship is, is kind of broken, okay? And for, for ANSYS, you know, we have kind of two main, um, two main um, applications, two main situations where this can occur, okay? And so the first situation is when we have plastic deformation. Right. And so when your, um, you know, when your um, deformation has exceeded the plastic limit, then you're going to start to deform plastically. Okay. And the other, um, the other main um, situation where you can have this is when you have a hyperelastic material. And so I'm just gonna go over both kind of um, very briefly, okay? Right. But before I do that, you know, in, in reality, you know, most, most materials have some kind of nonlinear behavior, um, you know, anyway, um, but most of the time it's, it's fairly negligible, right? And so, you know, when we, have a, when we have a linear situation or a linear material, you know, it's, it's less about saying that, you know, this material is, is always gonna perform linearly no matter what. It's more just saying that we're making an assumption um, that, you know, we assume the stress strain relationship to be mostly linear. Okay. All right. Okay. And so let's, uh, um, you know, um, let's talk about the reasons why we have these um, behaviors in the first place. Okay. And so for both plasticity and both and for hyperelasticity, the reason we have nonlinear behavior is the fact that 
you know, the relationship between stress and strain is dependent on time. Okay. Right. And so what I mean by that is that, you know, when, when we apply a load to a material, you know, it, it, it actually does take some time for that, for, that, uh, for that object to reach its final deformation state. Okay. And so we, we talked about this a little bit, you know, when, when we started talking about uh, nonlinear behavior, right? And so we, it's this kind of time dependence, okay? Um, because I think normally what we, what we assume when we do a static simulation is that when we apply the load onto a material, it just reaches its final deformation state instantaneously, right? Like we apply hundred pound loads on this beam and then instantaneously the beam is gonna de deform, right? Um, but we know that's not true, right? And so whenever you apply and load onto a, a structure, you know, sometimes it takes, you know, sometimes it takes place in the, over the course of a few milliseconds, uh, but sometimes it can take over the course of minutes um, for some, for some structures over the course of hours, um, some even over the course of days, you know, depending on what the material is. And so, you know, the fact that we have this kind of time dependent nature means that, you know, um, this is a nonlinear kind of stress strain uh, relationship, okay? All right. And so one and so one big exa example of this is uh, the filling of a water tower. Okay, um, and so if you fill a big water tower with water, um, it actually takes you know a really long time. And so over time, you know the water tower will kind of expand and expand and expand just from the weight of the water. You know, but that doesn't happen instantaneously. And so that that takes place over time. And so what that's uh, what that's often called is that's called creep kind of behavior. Right, so you might have heard that term before in your previous classes. Okay. Uh, or another, I, I think, trendy way to describe this is called the viscoelasticity. Okay. And so that's kind of a new hip trend word that people are using nowadays. And so um, all that basically means is that the, the material kind of exhibits some properties as a fluid, hence the visco part. And some properties as a solid, which hence the elastic part. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. So let's uh, so let's review plasticity really quick. Okay. Right. And so plasticity, the way it's defined is it's characterized by the presence of a residual strain in material that persists even after the load is released.
Okay. And so the uh, for plastic behavior, you know, we basically have a stress strain curve that looks like this. Okay. And so we have a linear portion. Okay. And then once we kind of reach this point, which is called the yield point. then we start to have this kind of plastic deformation like that. Okay. All right. And so by residual strain, you know, what I mean by this is this. And so let's say that we, uh, we take this material and we load it. Okay. And so let's say that we, we creep up this curve just like this. Okay. And so these, um, these red arrows here indicate that the material is loaded. And if we load it past the yield point, then it's going to continue deforming. Okay. But let's say then that we reach a point right here when the load is released. Okay. And so when the load is released, you know, we're going to travel down the down the curve again. Okay. Until we reach this point right here. Okay. And so at this point, we basically have no load is being applied, okay? Okay. And so even though we don't have any load, you know, we can see here that we have some strain in the material, right? And so this, this, this amount of strain, this is what's known as residual strain. Where this is our usual stress strain relationship. So down here on the x axis, we have strain, and on the y axis here, we have stress. Okay. All right. And so this is the type of behavior that you can model in, in ANSYS. Okay. All right. Any questions on, uh, on this? Okay. All right. And so, you know, I, I won't say, you know, too much more beyond this, you know, just because a lot of that is, is kind of, you know, repeat of what we covered when we talk about material properties. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about how this type of data is collected, okay? And so to get a plastic strain, um, stress strain curve for a lot of materials, you know, the way that is usually done is this is uh, determined by an experimental test called a uniaxial tensile test. Okay. And so what that basically means is that you, you get a, a strip of the material okay, or, or a chunk, okay, and then you apply a tension on it, okay, okay, where the tension is something that you can, you can directly control. And so this is usually done by some kind of you know, very high precision machine. Okay? And then as the tension is ramped up, then you, absorb, you observe um, the deformation of the bulk. And so depending on the relationship between the, the, um, the increasing tension and the amount of deformation that you see in the bar, um, that's how the plastic stress strain relationship is, is formed, okay? All right, and so this is, this is a great test because it's, it's, you, can, you can control it very tightly and it, and it always leads to very reliable data, 
And so there's usually, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, as far as mechanical testing comes, you know, this is one of the more basic ones. And so, you know, if someone does a uniaxial test, you trust it um, to be accurate. Okay. All right. But this test has a lot of uh, some shortcomings, right? Um, and so the first shortcoming is that, you know, the stress. And so, you know, under this, under this configuration right here, you know, the stress straight, the stress state within the, this material is only going in one direction. Uh, but as we know, you know, in a, in a very, in a typical practical situation, you're going to have stresses that go in all different kinds of directions. Okay. And so you can't directly compare, you can't directly compare the complex state of stress in a, in a, in a practical material with the unit axial uh, stress state, unless you use the equivalent von Mises stress. Right? And so that's why we're always looking at the equivalent stress, right? Because remember, the equivalent stress kind of takes into account all the different directions of stress. It takes into account shear stresses as well. And then it gives you one single number for stress that you can use to compare to basically uniaxial tensile data. Okay. All right. Any questions on, uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right, so we're so we're basically out of time, but I, I did want to make one quick note on hyperelasticity. Okay. Okay. okay, and so the idea with hyperelasticity is that you know the equivalent stress um, when you're trying to match with plastic data, you know equivalent stress is is one decent approximation, but a lot of materials are a lot more complex than this. Okay, uh, and in fact, you know the uniaxial tensile test is not the only mechanical test out there. Okay. And so if you want to make a material that's consistent with more complex data, with more complex um, you know, mechanical testing, usually you're going to have to use a hyperelastic material. Okay. All right. And so, you know, some of the other tests that uh, that's often performed are things like compressive tests, right? And so instead of doing a uniaxial tensile test, they do a uniaxial compressive test. Um, they do what's called a biaxial test. And so this one I'm, I'm familiar with because a lot of biological materials are like this, okay? And so in a biaxial test, you basically, you basically load the material in two different directions. Um, and then you, and then you observe the deformations, okay? There's also shear testing um, and also a lot of volumetric tests as well. Okay. And so when you have a lot of these kind of complex and very kind of um, you know, material data, you need a different material model to kind of accommodate that. And so the kind of the combination of linear elasticity and plasticity, um, you usually can't accommodate that. And so that's where hyperelasticity comes in. Okay. Um, and I feel bad. You know, I feel like this is the second time in a row I've had a short change hyperelasticity, but you know, we are out of time and, and I don't want to keep you guys any longer. Um, all right, so any final questions on, on this before we wrap it up for today? Okay, all right, and so that's all we got time for. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, this is the last that we'll see of nonlinearities. And so, you know, if you want to learn more about hyperplasticity, you know, you're free to, to um, come talk to me, okay? Um, but on Wednesday, we're going to start a new lecture notes on verification and validation, okay? Which is one important aspect of your final project. All right, so thank you guys for coming today. I, I know it's a little bit later than usual because of the daylight savings. So I appreciate everyone being here and, and being present. Um, and so hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Um, I'll stick around if you have any other questions about any other stuff and I will see you on Wednesday.
Yeah. 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 So there, there's several ways. So um, if you want to, if you want to do like a non-linear material, you have to do that kind of from the very beginning. So when you choose like your material engineering data, um, you have to choose your material to be hyperelastic from from the start. And so I, and so I would say that's kind of one of the more I'd say that's the second most common way to do it, um, especially if you're working with kind of a strange material. Uh, and so a lot of biological materials are And so that's one way you can do it. Um, for, uh, for other ways, there's you can, there's simply a toggle. And so if you go to like the analysis settings in your Ansys Mechanical, there's a toggle there if you want to enable more, what they call large deformation. And so you can just say yes and turn that on. And that's, that's another way you can introduce nonlinear. And so that type of nonlinearity is kind of like the first one that we went over about two weeks ago. And so that's when you have kind of nonlinear deformations. Um, and the third way is kind of what we talked about at the beginning, which is about contacts. And so if you have an assembly and you define some contacts to be like rough or frictionless or frictional, then you know, can also introduce a non -linear. So there, there's several different layers of different, several different levels of which you can use to introduce non -linear. Yeah, let's, let's talk a bit. Um, I got your email. Um, yeah, let's, let me let me answer the other question, then we'll talk. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to understand the difference in term. Yeah. So um, I know like out of five problems for yes. Yep. Um, um, this would be great that time. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so following that logic, I I calculated thirteen out of um, one mean thirteen out of. Oh, did I did I discount it? Uh, I maybe I, I maybe just double check. Okay. okay. Uh, okay, yeah, let me let me double check. Can you send me an email just to remind me? Um, yeah. and then I'll double check. Yeah, I I, I, I add these up wrong all the time. Okay. And I also um, wanted to uh, talk about the comments. Yeah, because uh, I don't see any comments regarding the discussion section and report aesthetics. And uh -huh. That's kind of where I lost a lot of the points. Okay. Um, and so I, I kind of I feel like I've earned a little bit more points in that area. Sure. So I was wondering if you Consider regrading like at least that portion. Okay, yeah, I, I can take a look in that. I can give you more detail from that on uh, why I, I took points off on that, etc. Because, like, because um, I feel like yeah, in terms of like report aesthetics, at least the, I think the report looks pretty clean. Okay. In, in terms of uh, legibility. Okay. And uh, I followed the, the the root. I mean, the template. Like, uh -huh. I literally just wrote over the template. Okay. And this, so okay. I feel like getting a nine out of it. <laughs> Is discouraging a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me take another look. Yeah, because there there's just so many I graded last last week and then um and I'll, I'll give you I'll give you some more detail. All right. Thank you so much. I'll yeah. send you an email. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, Professor. Right. I have the same question. Mm -hmm. Two points for prediction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's too low. Um. Can you um yeah? Can you yeah. send me an email? On yes. Sir. So what what do you prefer? Do you think they use the wider materials? Common for the philosophy and second discussion could be expensive. I see. So, so I think probably for a discussion, I think, I think probably, and so you're and you're not the only one. So I think for other people too. Like I felt like they answered the question um, that I put in the discussion um, in, the, in the kind of discussion section, but I feel like you know you could have expanded a lot more. So more. I guess probably what it is like maybe I'll explain the conclusion other than decision discussion. Um, maybe I mean, maybe I don't know. I, I have to look at your reporting. The last thing, like, is for aesthetic, I mean, like, I have no issue, like, you did a play, like, two, like, two. But if it's possible, can you explain more, like, what you want in report aesthetic? Okay, so I can take that. Sure, there. sure. So, can you, uh, can you send me an email? And I I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a question. Is it like the final mm -hmm. So, uh, remember, yeah. like, we had a problem about homework and device. I'm thinking you run it on the end. Okay. The five seconds. Okay. Yeah. So I already have a data mm -hmm. but I am working with Okay. I'm gonna have to ask him whether he can do it. Sure. Yeah. yeah. If you uh, yeah, if you send me the, the picture of the cat file, then then we can do it. Yeah, but I will ask the professor for sure. 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 Second thing is like, can can I do the explicit or the explicit dynamics of the five seconds? Okay. Yeah. Um, it would have to be kind of a specific. Um, application of it, especially so, like like if I want to show that the bicycle is moving by itself. That would be hard. That would be hard to do. So the the dynamics of I mean we only covered the very basic dynamics that we can do in physics, and so it would have to be something that happens really quickly. 
um, so like if you, if you want to simulate like the bicycle like um, colliding with a wall or something that's something that you can do um, but it would have to be something that occurs over, over a very quick period because a big a long animation would be extremely expensive the technique you were saying i should stick with the static structure technically yes most for most yes but then but if you want to do dynamics as part of your part of your project you want to do additional features then it would have to be something that happens in a really short time something Okay, I will have a look and see. I'll just focus your work with you. Okay. Okay. But I will send you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Professor. All right, Sam. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yep. What's yeah, up? I have, I have a question. Sure. Do you have any um, open spaces for um, for like the the master's program? For uh, oh. sorry, for like the projects oh for projects um so um i i do i did just have a few students that just graduated um but normally um and so you know i and so i, I do i do have capacity to advise more students um but you know usually usually i i like to talk and and discuss with the students kind of beforehand and see if there's see if it's going to be a good fit for a project you know before we commit to anything and so um, okay so if you want to send me an email just um, you know, tell me and just tell me what you're you're interested in in researching. And so, um, you know, I'm I'm my style is I'm I'm less about like, um, you know, having someone work. I I don't, I don't have very many long standing projects where I, I need people to work on. I'm more interested in 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 making something happen that you're personally interested in. And so, um, and so and so I'll tell I'll tell you some of my my own expertise. And so you know, obviously you know, finite elements is something that something that I have expertise in. Um, but in terms, but in terms of like specific research interests, you know, I, I do a lot of biomedical uh, biomedical research, and so specifically, what I do is I I I, um, I work on software um, that simulates blood flow, and so um, what I do is I basically I make CAD models of of, of the blood vessels inside a person's body, um, or sometimes even medical devices, and then I run basically computational fluid dynamics simulations on them, um, and that's and that and that data is used for. Um, cardiovascular disease research it's used for designing medical devices uh, or even designing new medical procedures too and so um you know that's that's kind of very quick you know ev elevator pitch of what yeah. i do but, uh, but i but i but i am interested in seeing you know what what kinds of problems you're interested in, in looking at and seeing if we can find a good fit um along along those lines and so um so yeah so so i mean send me an okay. email um send me an email tell me what you're interested in and what you were thinking of doing for a project and and, and you know we'll see if we can make it work um but, and but i do want to tell you that usually um you know unless you're going to work on the thesis you know full time or work on the project full time um i do require you know at, at least a year to work on the project because it's it's you know usually usually it takes a while to kind of you know um yeah. develop the idea and learn because there's a lot of new skills that you're going to have to learn too and so all that takes a lot of time and then you have to get the data you have to run the tests and then you know you have to write it up too so that process usually takes around a year and so um, and so I, I don't know what your timeline right now and, and when you want to graduate, but you know, um, if we count like a year starting starting in January, like we'll start in January. I think that's yeah. at least um, earliest practically that we can start a project. Um, that, if, that's what I was kind of hoping for, like to start okay. this spring and finish by the end of the year next year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That that uh, timing works out then. So um, yeah, go ahead and send me an email, and then um, you know, and then we can we can we can discuss more about it there. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye. Right. Manuel, did you have uh, any other questions? Okay. All right. I'm going to sign off.